I think I managed all, all, all of yesterday to speak in between the microphones, so <laughs> probably nobody heard a word I said. Uh, anyway, so this, uh, this session is, is, is very kind of vaguely titled uh, Upcoming uh, Projects, but I actually think there's, there's far more that's going to uh, connect uh, these, these three talks than, than would be apparent from, the, from that title. So we have uh, speaking, we have, um, I'd say it's not, I don't have quite the kind of same track record of, of, of working with, uh, with uh, our speakers that Penelope had yesterday, but certainly an interesting thing of, of two people who I know and one uh, who I've just met uh, um, through this event, which is great. So first we have um, um, on your list, uh, uh, Natalie Rudd, the uh, senior curator of the Arts Council Collection, uh, who's been very uh, kind in receiving students from York uh, over the years to come to visit uh, the, the collection there at, at Longside and, and um, uh, remarkable exhibitions that she's done there and, and elsewhere. And, uh, and then also Sarah uh, uh, Matson, curator of Tate St. Ives, who uh, had the pleasure of working with in relation to a CDA uh, project that so collaborated with with Chris on uh, someone who might have been here and who unfortunately isn't uh, uh, Rachel Smith PhD student connection to the uh, wonderful exhibition on um, St Ives uh, international connections that was at St Ives and then at the Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art and then um, someone who I've just uh, just met and delighted uh, uh, could take part in this event uh, Joe uh, Baring from the uh, Ingram collection now unfortunately uh, Jo is going to have to leave rapidly after uh, giving her, her presentation. We're really, really grateful to her for actually for, for staying on to uh, uh, give this. So we're going to go, as I believe, uh, going to look uh, vaguely into the audience here. We're going to go uh, Jo, then Natalie, then, then Sarah. Okay, so... Um, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be on the panel with Natalie and Eleanor, who um, I actually, Sarah and I, interviewed for our Sculpting Lives project. So that was um, very serendipitous. Well done, Eleanor, for putting us all together. So Sculpting Lives is a podcast series on women and sculpture. And we have been quite uh, thoughtful about the terminology. We don't say women sculptors uh, because actually quite a lot of them later on, so some of the later um, women making sculpture that we interviewed, particularly someone like Rana Begum, specifically says she's not a sculptor, she doesn't make sculpture. And that kind of terminology is something that we think about um, within the podcast series. Um, obviously someone like Hepworth is very much talking about sculpture. So it came about, um, I have started this project with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Victoria Turner, who I'm sure lots of you are aware of from the Paul Mellon Center. And we were chatting about various areas of research that we're doing and um, thinking about ways that we can disseminate our information and our research in new ways. Obviously, podcasting is hugely popular at the moment, and we thought that would be maybe something that we'd like to try as an experiment in terms of disseminating information in this new way. Obviously, with art, it's quite tricky because it's, we can't illustrate that, so we've had to learn um, how to describe things, particularly talking about sculpture on a podcast has been quite tricky. Um, the Paul Mellon Center, again, they obviously do a lot of research and um, sponsor a lot of research projects, and they felt that podcasting within art history was something that they wanted to look into further. So we're very lucky that they have sponsored this podcasting series. So we have done it about women and sculpture. And we were listening to one of the Artists' Lives recordings and Philida Barlow was interviewed. And Philida said that when she went to art school, she encountered Reg Butler. And apparently one of the first things Reg said to her was, apart from Barbara, name another woman sculptor, quickly followed by, let me tell you, there are none. Um, so that's kind of where we started our research with that. This is us, this is me in the Henry Moore Institute, which is one of the first areas that we went. And we were looking then about literature, who gets written about, why people get written about, the number of women inserted into the narrative. And that's how we began. Um, we came up here at the Hepworth Wakefield to interview Eleanor. There's uh, Sarah there being interviewed. So basically it's a it's a six-part series called Sculpting Lives, and each episode takes a woman sculptor as its subject. And we explore the artworks, networks, connections, and relationships of these artists. And we've recorded each episode in places that are significant for these women. Their studios, 
as well as galleries and public places where their art is on display. And we include new interviews with curators, friends, family, and the artists themselves. So what stood out for us across all our interviews with curators, working with and looking after Hepworth's work today, was obviously um, the esteem with which the sculpture is held and how her work continues to shape contemporary artists. So a lot of the artists that we interview later on in the series think about Hepworth as a lodestar in terms of how she shaped her career and the significance of her work. Um, so compared to many women sculptors working in Britain, there has been a good amount written about Barbara Hepworth, both about her work and her life. And yet what we discovered was that so many people that we interviewed feel there's so much more to be found out about her. Um, the podcast format allows us really to go behind the scenes and to create what we called soundscapes of the places that meant the most to the artist. And as we followed Hepworth across her career, one of the main topics of our conversation was how she negotiated the question of gender in relation to her artistic practice. How did she describe her work? What barriers did she face in becoming a sculptor? How did she describe the experience of being one of a small handful of women artists exhibiting on an international stage in mid 20th century? The answers aren't clear cut. And we also found out that her response to those questions shifted across the course of her career. We also ask people and discuss how she negotiated the challenges of a very busy home life with a dedication to her profession and also the fact that in her lifetime she refused to let biography impact the way she was viewed as an artist, insisting she was to be understood as an artist rather than a woman artist. Such questions about terminology, identity and self-positioning feel extremely relevant and alive today. We also talked about kind of practical things because obviously this is a podcast series which is going out to a wider public and we wanted to not just rehash the normal narratives about Hepworth, we wanted to delve into things a bit more and also go behind the scenes for people. So talking about the practicalities of being an artist, the logistics of being an artist. So we talked about um, studio space, particularly with Sarah, we went across to the Palais. We talked about the practicalities of having a business, so making things. You, know, you have to secure larger spaces in which to make more ambitious, large-scale public works. Um, the transition to bronze, trying to explain a bit more about how important that was. Uh, the, the feeling that she was really positioning herself on a world stage, how you do that, and how, and I think Chris mentioned yesterday, you know, that sort of difficulty that she had in that transition to bronze, but the impact that that had on her career. Um, we talk about the awareness of legacy, um, and, and the, just sort of looking about how the Hepworth Wakefield came about, St. Ives, talking to Sarah, um, all those sorts of things. And within that, it was sort of placing her at the beginning, obviously everyone's heard of Hepworth, and it was kind of push, positioning her in the first episode as someone that, to kind of to, to, to compare the later careers of the women sculptors that we then talk about um, within the episodes. So after Hepworth, so there we go, so a few little images. We, we then go on to Frink. Um, so I'll just do a little bit more about the women that we have, we've spoken about in, in the um, podcast series. So Elizabeth Frink we chose because in 1973, she was the first female sculptor to be elected as a royal academician. She was born into an army family. Her childhood was um, affected by the Second World War. And this experience and other upheavals of the 20th century led her to ask fundamental questions about the nature of humanity in her work and in an art world increasingly dominated by abstraction, she remained resolute in her commitment to both working figuratively and in bronze. When she died in 1993, she had created over 400 sculptures, and many of which are well-known public commissions. And so within the Frink episode, we explore hidden narratives in Frink's career and consider how artists can be sidelined almost by the art world, yet remain popular with the public. Um, we also consider the impact an artist's families has on their posthumous reputation, how this is managed. And again, Frink, quite similarly to Hepworth, refused to talk about the gender issue. She absolutely shuts down any conversations about that, which we find really interesting. Obviously, both Hepworth and Frink are working before those sorts of the real feminist art history of the 1970s, which obviously we've all imbibed and we're kind of aware of all those narratives and terminology. And that was before that. So if, if we go across the series, by the time you get to... I mean, even Philida is talking about it, but in a different way to someone like Rana Begum, who is very open, very frank, and makes it absolutely part of the work and part of the conversation about her work. Um, that's Frank looking cool. That's, um, 
This is just about materiality. So this is the horse's mane on the horse and rider, in, um, which was in Burlington Gardens, uh, which is in Burlington Gardens. And it was a kind of exactly how you describe the materiality of bronze in a podcast series. So we've got Cathy Pilkington, who is um, the first female professor of, Royal, of sculpture at the Royal Academy to come and talk to us about that, which is fascinating, getting an artist's um, input. Kim Lim is someone that we... Um, have done an episode on. And Kim is fascinating because although there are over 80 works by Kim Lim in public collections in the UK, she's really, really unknown. And why is that? So with Kim, it's gender, but it's also race. So there was that very famous um, exhibition, The Other Story at the Hayward Gallery, I think 1987, which she refused to take part in. So she actually wrote a letter saying, I do not want to be othered. Do not other me which I find fascinating. Is that something that we talk about within that? And she said, there's a quote from her, which says, being female and foreign was never a problem as a student. Later, I realized that there was a difference, but what was important in the end was, was what I did and not where I came from. Race and gender were givens I worked from. Perhaps the work does reflect this, which is fine, but I did not want to make them an issue. So we also, within that episode, we examined the presence of ethnic minority artists in public collections in the UK, looking at the history of British art and how to expand the narratives. Um, so we talked to Hamad Nasir, who was a research fellow at the Paul Mellon Centre, and he has done a lot of work around that. And prior to knowing about Kim Lim, had said that you know, the only way to get into art history narratives is to be in public collections, but obviously Kim is in all these public collections and yet is still not part of that narrative. So that's something that we're exploring within that. Um, and someone that we interviewed about Kim Lim says, she never wanted to be perceived as being other just because she was a woman and foreign. And then we did Philida and Philida is obviously brilliant about being interviewed and is incredibly frank. And one of the, uh, in addition to kind of Reg saying to her name, a woman, woman sculptor, he said to her when she turned up at art school, I'm not going to bother with you because as a woman, by the time you're 30, you're just going to be making jam and having babies. And Phyllida said, she has said, at least I had the presence of mind to turn around and say, and what's wrong with that? Um, <laughs> but she then says, and was in our new interview with her, this is what she said. She talks about those sorts of issues when you arrive as a student. And she says, it's interesting to have those challenges thrown down, but it's also, you know, you've got to muster this tremendous single-mindedness these things act as the most extraordinary trigger for your future. Uh, so within that, obviously, throughout the series, we are talking about definitions of sculpture as well, about materials. Um, it's something that we pick up on each one of the, of the artists that we're looking at. And Barlow particularly comes to the fore in that, obviously disrupting ideas about what sculpture is. And we ask her about that. She also talks about Hepworth within those ideas about sculpture, 20th century British art. And this is Rana. So Rana is very interesting. So she says, when we asked her about her sculptural language, she said in the interview with her, I don't want to use a language that really segregates people. I don't want to use a language that makes them think about gender if they are looking at a female artist or a male artist. Um, so we interviewed her in her studio. And again, we asked her about definitions of sculpture and also about things which aren't usually spoken about, um, how she balances her family life with her artistic career, the problems that she's encountered. And again, we ask her about race. So it's biography, race, identity, and also that feeling of Britishness. So she talks about Brexit and she said that she cried the day that Brexit happened, but also that she lives in Hackney and she said that when she steps out of Hackney, she, well, I'll read what she says in our interview. She says, living in East London, I feel almost like I'm living in a bubble. You leave and you are made to remember your skin color. You're made to remember your gender. You're made to remember your religion and all of those things that you take for granted when you live in a place like this. So we've picked these women artists. The, the series is being released at the end of, um, at the, end of uh, the 24th of March, the Barbara Hepworth one comes out. And they're each 45 minutes long. And I think for the Hepworth one, we had about 23 hours worth of recording. So it's really hard to distill it all down into a coherent narrative, which, as I said, isn't just a rehashing. That is picking up interesting themes and with a sort of light touch throughout. So hopefully it'll be accessible. It'll bring sculpture and Hepworth to a wider audience. Um, as I said, we've interviewed lots of people who are in this room, which is really exciting, and talking about 
new things and hopefully getting people to look at Hepworth and these sculptures and sculptors in a different way. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, so nice to be here and thank you to the Hepworth, to Claire, Eleanor for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our new project, Breaking the Mould, Sculpture by Women since 1945. This is a new exhibition, but it's also a new way of looking at and interrogating the Arts Council collection. And I also hope that it will change the way that we think about lending and our processes going forward. Just to say that the Arts Council collection is the largest loan collection of British art in the world, with nearly 8,000 works by more than 2,000 artists. We're a library. We're designed to be nomadic. We go to museums and galleries, but we also go to universities, schools and hospitals, and to reach parts which other collections do not reach. And we're here to encourage the appreciation of British art across the UK, but also to support artists by investing in their work. And with modest investment every year, we now, we now have this amazing public resource that belongs to everybody. So where does this project stem from? Well, we were contacted by Hilary Gresty, freelance curator, and Dr. Catherine George from the University of Lincoln, who have set up a fledgling network called Women Working in Sculpture, sculpture from the 1960s to the present day towards a new lexicon. And they had some funding from the Henry Moore Foundation to in interview about 30 artists of all ages working in the UK to talk about their experiences of, of operating as a sculptor in this, sculptor in this country. And we were really struck by the fact that we have very strong holdings of sculpture by women. We have um, over 253 works by, uh, um, by 150 artists. And that accounts to about 81% uh, male compared to 18% female across the whole collection. But with sculpture, it's about 25% women. So we feel we've got a lot of resource that we could apply to this subject and to investigate it afresh. There's some quite sobering statistics in the fact that 30% of sculptures by women have not been lent during the past 10 years. So although we've got great holdings, perhaps we're not using them uh, quite as substantially as we could. And the Arts Council collection is an interesting starting point for sculpture because the first work by a sculptor ever to be acquired for the collection was this work by Barbara Hepworth called Reconstruction, which Chris Stevens has written about extensively and very interestingly in an, in an essay. And here, um, the artist Barbara Hepworth is, is, uh, was given special permission to, to, ex to, to explore the work of, of surgeons. And um, we see this female figure to one side, looking from a little bit of a distance. And for me, I think this speaks about working across disciplines, but also about working collectively, something that's very pertinent today. But I think that that's what we hope to do with this exhibition, is to work collectively, to put things out there, to share ideas, and to, to open up some new conversations. So it's not the definitive exhibition of sculpture by women, but really a starting point for a wider conversation. I think there are some really good news stories coming out of the collection in recent years. So, for example, in 2018 to 2019, the entire external panel for buying works of art for the collection was uh, entirely female. But I also think you have to be quite cautious about some, some good news stories sometimes and to delve underneath the surface when you look at the uh, glass ceiling as your eye casts further down the list within the institutions that we're talking about here. Also in 2018 to 19, more work by women than men was acquired for the first time in our history. So there are definitely developments happening in this area. We've also been working hard to address gaps in recent years, such as Margaret Organ. We featured her work in Making It, our exhibition exploring sculpture from the 1980s in Britain. And although her work was entirely destroyed, she was able to work with us to remake this piece, Loop, from 1978 very faithfully. And we are now the only collection in the country that represents her sculpture. Also, as you can see, we're increasingly uh, casting our net to external funding to be able to afford sculpture by women, such as this piece by Helen Martin, which does indicate the value of sculpture by women increasing in this way. And also, we purchased this work by Phila de Barlow. But again, I think you have to look behind the good news stories and say that we purchased this work in 2016 and we really had missed the boat because, not, not missed the boat, but we were several decades late in investing in this artist's work, I think it's fair to say. 
Um, so I'm going to whiz. I've probably got more slides than we were able to fit into a 10-minute talk, but I did want to give you a flavour of the exhibition. All of the works in the show are from the Arts Council collection. We felt, because we had so many, it was hard enough to choose down from the works that we had. I've put these slides together chronologically, but the show will be presented thematically to enable intergenerational dialogue to unfurl across the exhibition. You can see this is the first sculpture that we acquired by a woman from the 1951 Festival of Britain by Karen Johnson, seated nude. And we also quickly respond to work by Elizabeth Frink and other artists of this generation, including Rosemary Young. And Henry Moore was really kind of critical in the development of the early collections, but he does invest in, in sculpture by women. And I think that... Um, a lot of these artists were really trying to build their careers, but often through male associations. So Rosemary Young was uh, uh, um, the partner of Reg Butler, and although she had very early success, she eventually gave over her entire career to supporting his. And she said, there was always a strong demand on me to help. He couldn't work with assistance, and the only person that's ever worked with him all the way, all the way through... I mean, I was in an incredibly pr privileged position to be able to be that person, but it became, that was my role, so there was no space to suddenly say, I'm going to make a sculpture, and anyway, it had gone, it had just disappeared. Anthea Alley, she was the wife of Ronald Alley, very senior at the Tate, and this is not to berate these artists' work, but to say that it was not just that they needed to be operating as a sculptor, but also to have this wider male connection or network to enable them a foothold into the sphere. Barbara Hepworth, we have a work by Icon, uh, this wonderful work called Icon of 1957 and also Spring, which Laura Davis shared yesterday being restrung. And um, Jo has uh, already spoken about some of Hep Hepworth's feelings here, but I think there's a very famous quote where she says, there is a deep prejudice against women in art. Many people, most people still, I imagine, think that women should not involve themselves in the art of creation except on its more trivial fringes. Um, and we hope to show here major figures, but also lesser known names whose work has become obscured over time. And this is not to say that we even have very many much research on these artists. This is opening it up so that we can start thinking about these artists in more detail. Um, and as we go into the 1960s, I think we see something quite interesting in the artists are starting to fight back. So this is a work by Jan Howarth called Calendula's Cloak. And she said of her experiences at the Slade. The assumption was that the girls were there to keep the boys happy. Um, the tutor prefaced that by saying it wasn't necessary for them to look at the portfolios of the female students. They just needed to look at their photos. And from that point on, it was head-on competition with the male students. I was annoyed enough and American enough to take that on. I was determined to better them, and that's one of the reasons for the partly sarcastic choice of cloth, latex, and sequins as media. It was a female language to which the male students didn't have access so the show touches on the ways in which artists have deliberately used feminine materials, techniques or colours in their work, but also to really celebrate the fact that, that artists have continued to work with a whole range of other industrial materials and on, a, and on a large scale as well, such as this piece by Wendy Taylor, which hasn't been out for many years but was looking super alongside Gallery recently for its moment of being re-photographed. And she described the experience of being at St. Martin's as absolute hell, that men didn't want them on their lists of students, they, uh, fellow students wouldn't share their tools with women, and they didn't get even, they had to fight even to get metal to work with. So I think there's a whole um, subject around the experience of women in art school that has been explored so far, but actually there's more that can be brought out here. Um, but also women in this time, 1970s, it's a pretty grim time for the Arts Council collection. Statistically, across the decade, we acquire six sculptures by women. And um, when you look at the list of people buying and the list of sculptures coming into the collection, it's men from a certain demographic buying work by men from a certain demographic. The lessons of feminism take a lot longer in terms of their impact on the shape of the Arts Council collection. I think a lot of artists at this time are so sick of the institutional biases that start to work outside of the gallery, working on public sculpture projects such as Wendy Taylor and Lillian Lynn. 
I think we see a, change, a sea change around 1980, 1981, and I can only say that this comes about through a diversification of the workforce. Suddenly, the Arts Council collection starts to open up the people that start to, to, to choose which works come into the collection. So in the 1980s, we've got Shirazi Hushiari, Sonia Boyce, Lynn Cook, Sheila Wakeley, a whole range of voices shaping and making the collection into something else, a much more positive and diverse representation of artists working in this country. And they invest fairly early on, 1981, in Mary Kelly's postpartum document, which gives a theoretical proof of the possibility that women can operate as artists and parents. And I think that there is an extremely rich and fertile area to be considered in terms of the relationship between sculpture and becoming a mother. Um, I'd like to just read out this quote by Philida Barlow. She says, the biggest transformation for me was perhaps having to move away from a routine that was very expansive. I could begin at seven in the morning and work till 10 at night. With a baby, that was not possible. So I began to work at night in the dark with no lights on. And because I became so fascinated by touching and feeling a baby when you're cleaning or washing it, and all the wonderful non-verbal contact you have with this creature, I think it got into the work in the form of a real exploration of touch. And because I turned the lights off, I was using materials in a very non-visual way. So, <clears throat> I've had various conversations with artists recently on this subject, and I think it's also another area that this exhibition could prompt some further re research into thinking about. Um, but as you can see from the um, selection of works here, suddenly we are really capturing some really key works by artists at a critical early point in their career. And this develops all the way through into the 1980s, and it becomes much, much harder to make an exhibition for an ex uh, a selection for an exhibition such as Breaking the Mold. Some of these works, like these pieces by Sakari Douglas Gamp, again, haven't been out for a very long time. But the Arts Council was deliberately working to increase diversity across its collection throughout the 1980s. And I think in the 1990s, we start to see. Um, um, a second generation, so Rachel Whiteread supporting Alison Wilding as her studio assistant for a long time. And I think having role models really helps artists to develop their careers in this way. And also I think minimalism and post-minimalism does create a lot of um, neutral space really for women to operate and to shed some of those sort of macho narratives around welding in previous generations. This is just one of the most recent works to enter the collection by Katie Cudden and this piece by Holly Hendry. So you can see it's going to be a challenge to hang because we have so much amazing work, but also to give the works the space that they need, um, but to create some really simple structures to allow works to chime together. So the exhibition will talk to five venues nationally. I'm really delighted um, that we've had such a strong response to this exhibition and we've tried to work with venues in a really open way to to work with venues to shape the content in a way that we haven't done before. So this has been quite an exploratory exhibition on various different levels. But the show will launch alongside Gallery Yorkshire Sculpture Park, hopefully at the beginning of April. Um, we're also really uh, invested in, in showing we've got some good national resources. So we've made some new film content with Rana Begum, Holly Hendry, and a wonderful film where some children from a primary school near Leeds are doing an inter inter, uh, uh, transatlantic conversation with Jan Howarth about sculpture and making. And finally, I hope that this show will not just be a show that happens and then ends, but actually it will inform all our thinking about who we lend, who selects our exhibitions, and how we move forward. So I hope that although we've only been able to show 50 works in this exhibition, we will also ensure that more of that collection is seen through our lending strategies nat nationally to schools, universities, and hospitals. Uh, and also thinking about our legacy, there's some great headlines in our current ways of working, but actually, are they cemented in our policy? Is there more that we can do? Um, what other research can we do into our holdings? Because certainly that I know that there are many gaps at the moment. And we hope to have an, a conference at the University of in Not Nottingham in early summer 2021. So I do hope that some of you will be able to join us for that. Thank you very much.
So I'm just, this is just going to roll as I talk. So look there, not at me. That's going to be, um, and it's kind of a little bit of a walking tour of the Palais de Dance for those of you that haven't um, been in and for those that you haven't seen it, that haven't seen it for a while. So hopefully it will tell a story as I'm talking about um, Tate's involvement with this project. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? Yeah, um, these are photographs from 2015 largely interspersed with um, images of Hepworth working in the space. So hopefully that will make some sort of sense. Um, but um, it's changed and progressed since then uh, because we've um, had to clear the space. But I'll, I'm going to read because otherwise we'll be here for an hour. In March 2015, the management of Barbara Hepworth's second studio, the Palais de Dance, was transferred from her family to the custody of Tate. Tate, having been responsible for the running of Hepworth's Turin Studio Museum since 1980, was the logical custodian to undertake the care and the visioning of this extensive warren of workshops, yard, office space, and stores that also incurred, um, sorry, that also included um, a dance floor, um, tea room, film projection room, stage, and a 24 metre sprung dance floor. Um, and this became the focus of Hepworth's working life from its acquisition in 1961 until about 1967. At this point, she returned to working full-time um, at Trewin due to failing health and mobility issues, having broken her femur um, on the Isles of Scilly. Um, like Trewin Studio, which had provided a timely new base for her, the expansion of her studio practice when she first hit the national and international stage after the war, notably preparing for her Venice Biennale show in 1950 and undertaking her Totemic Festival of Britain commission contrapuntal forms uh, in 1951. A good decade on the purchase of the Palais was essential to support production of works for national and international commissions and touring museum shows, which was now demanded of this established leading British sculptor. Um, sunk into the hill directly across from the uh, Trewin studio in the centre of St Ives, the Palais offers an even more capacious working environment with substantial storage that could facilitate the engineering and rigorous working of her monumental prototypes, which were cast in the most part directly into bronze. Um, she had um, adopted the process since the mid-1950s, driven by the travelling circus of the art world, as she called it, um, and the uh, need to make robust large-scale works for the public realm. As Sophie Boness documents in her catalogue of, um, of the plasters in the collection here at Tepworth Wakefield, a good number of these prototypes were conceived uh, in this um, prolific uh, late, uh, late sort of career period in the workshops and dance hall at the Palais de Dance. Um, records show that Hepworth paid um, £10,000 for the Palais in 1961 following the last dance um, at this town venue uh, on the 2nd of January that year. Largely, she retained the character of the building throughout, whitewashing the walls and making only a handful of practical modifications, such as enlarging the exit from the first floor um, to improve access onto the Barnoon Hill, um, and designing glassine doors um, to close off the, the, the dance hall um, from the workshop. She quickly began planning the 5.8 metre commission winged figure um, for John Lewis on Oxford Street, and the full-scale model was completed in the yard outside the lower workshop on the ground level uh, in the first half of 1962. Inspired by the sheet metal and isopon version uh, with strings that um, you can see that will come up in the, uh, in the dance hall, um, uh, it was revised on an architectural scale to reflect the aspirational gap values of the partnership organisation and adorn the facade of its newly built flagship store uh, in 1963. Um, it was cast in London by Morris Singer Foundry in aluminium with stainless steel rods and installed in 1960. Uh, sorry, yeah, and it was installed in 1963, and you can see it here. Um, concurrently, uh, in the upper workshop uh, on the ground floor, she had begun work on the development of the plaster prototype for what would become the 6.4 metre bronze single form uh, uh, made between 1961 and 64, commissioned for the UN Plaza in memory of Hepworth's friend, uh, the UN Secretariat, Dag Hammarskjöld. Um, the painted chequered scaling grid on the wooden floor of the upper workshop made with her son Simon was used to enlarge the UN prototype from a smaller version and remains on the weathered wooden floor of the upper workshop today. 
Um, the plaster for single form memorial 1961 to 2, a half scale version of the UN Commission, emerged concurrently in the upstairs dance hall before it was featured in Hepworth's 1962 Whitechapel show in London. Other works, such as squares with two circles and four square walkthrough, which we saw yesterday, made in 1963 to 4 and 1966 to 7, respectively, relate to the proportions of the lower workshop, with the latter um, work, four square walkthrough, reaching the full height of the raised ceiling that was created by Hepworth, breaking through the rafters to the room above. Um, from the remaining floor space, um, she created a um, makeshift, well, from the remaining fl uh, floor, floor, floor space of the upper uh, room, um, she created a, um, a mezzanine so that she could work at height on um, sculptures. One of the last prototypes made in, Hepworth, um, in Hepworth's um, modified workshop and adjoining yard was the epic aluminium construction crucifixion of 1966-7, also in the collection here. At nearly 4 by 4.7 metres, its final version was cast in addition of three bronzes. And I seem to remember when I started at Tate's and Ives, um, I remember it was on the stage at one point. Is that... No, it wasn't on the stage? But it was in the Palais, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, upstairs in the Palais, um, the small hall and bar area, and on occasion the dance hall, as mentioned, served as a plaster workshop. Um, in archive images we see Hepworth's ribboning forms in extruded aluminium or um, sorry in um, archive images we see Hepworth ribboning forms in extruded aluminium or um, lathering armatures with thick layers of plaster in advance of its drying and her carving it. Um, the dance hall was mostly a display space populated with bronze stone and woodworks presented on uh, wheeled plinths which she could choreograph in different configurations. Um, the dance hall, albeit to a lesser degree, was also used for um, wood carving, uh, giving rise, for example, to Elmwood sculptures like uh, Oval Form with Strings and Colour and Hollow Form uh, with White, both made in 1965, which were then directly cast again from um, those works into bronze as Spring, uh, which we saw yesterday, and Elegy Three um, the following year. After 1967, production of the plaster prototypes, such as her small multi-part bronzes like uh, Three Oblique Forms, 1967, um, in the uh, Hepworth Wakefield collection and on show at the um, Barbara Hepworth Museum, and the large-scale figures for Family of Man, and, uh, which is 1970, and Conversation with Magic Stones, 1973, took place back at Trewin. Her output of stone carving had remained largely at Turin anyway, um, and she continued to pr um, work prolifically there in that medium well into the 70s, as Chris discussed yesterday. Um, Hepworth's assistants, however, continued to manage certain independent activities, such as collating, preparing and packing work for shows at the Palais um, up until her death. Um, so when Tate took on the Palais in 2015, it was immediately... Um, uh, deemed to be mothballed um, for at least two years while um, the Tate St. Ives Phase 2 was completed and also some um, redevelopment work um, that needed to be done, some um, restoration work on the, on the museum itself, um, both um, on the building and uh, in the garden. But in 2016, with advice um, from Chris and Sophie, uh, we endeavoured to strip back the paraphernalia that had accumulated from the studio's um, maintenance um, uh, at, from the studio's maintenance and Tate's use of the space between 1980 and 2015. So, you know, that literally was the start of um, just removing anything with a barcode uh, that, uh, you know, had crept into the um, studio space and then starting from there to um, sift through, um, you know, period um, studio material. This uh, brought up interesting debates around cultural value and knowledge values and what items had agency to convey the idea of Hepworth without necessarily being deemed of individual worth. This was independent, uh, sorry, this was dependent on perspective. The remaining contents were inventorized and then reassessed by conservation. The Hepworth costume from the 1956 um, Penwith Arts Ball, for example, went to store for immediate controlled storage and conservation, but ropes and pulleys, plinths and dollies used regularly by the artist 
uh, every day, um, stayed um, in the studio uh, in an uncontrolled uh, environment. Uh, in the transfer of title from the family to uh, Tate, three covenanted items that include the glassine do divided doors on the dance hall entrance designed by Hepworth and the strung, sprung maple dance floor and the upper workshop floor uh, with the outline of single form were highlighted as being of outstanding cultural value and these items are monitored specifically by conservation with active co um, care plans. Um, I'm not sort of commenting on um, what's right or wrong, but it's just interesting to um, consider those debates as to what has cultural value or what doesn't have cultural value in these kind of um, different uh, environments. In 2016, the Tate trustees accepted the contents of both studios. Um, the BHM contents had not formally been acquired, um, although the building had, uh, and it, but the, um, in the 1980 transfer, and for Tate to accession the materials from the two studios, um, an entirely new criterion has been created within the collection um, as they sit outside of the status of both archive and main collection. You know, uh, they are in this kind of limbo space. Going forward, the act of an art museum acquiring the artist's second studio is something that could helpfully offer um, alterna alternative approaches to Hepworth's working life in St Ives beyond the voice and constraint of the artist, which is both so fundamental to fixing how we understand and experience the unique atmosphere of Turin. I mean, it's, it, it's definitely something that um, the public or Tate would not, would not seek to change in that museum, but you know, it's interesting to think about how that second studio might operate in, it, in, a, in a less fixed format. Um, in converse, on conservation terms, of course, the Hepworth Museum is viewed as ever-changing, perennially maturing, deteriorating, evolving, um, and it redefines itself um, and the contents of its studios, workshops and gardens um, as they weather over time. So even in its mothballed state, the Palais de Dance is also changing. Um, the necessity to implement planning and to future-proof the building and its contents um, is becoming ever more urgent. It's not just for those um, who see the importance of the artist, but also at grassroots level, those stakeholders who have engaged with the building with its various other domestic trade and community histories. In the last 18 months, we've been managing a series of rigorous building surveys that um, are contributing to our knowledge and interpretation of the site in order to implement a um, conservation management plan that will, with hope, incite the visioning for the Palais' next iteration as a heritage and arts venue. Um, with this and the building's imminent listing status being confirmed, the cultural value of this building can um, be elevated sufficiently to be recognised as at risk and mobilise necessary agencies to support the preservation of this extraordinary space that records a short but important feature in Hepworth's international legacy. Well, that was some amazing, amazing stuff. So, like, like loads and loads of questions. I've got. I'm just conscious a little of, of of time to get to the um, audience in quite quite quickly. Um, I guess something that that struck me right at the beginning when 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 Joe was talking, and just something really for, for both of you straight away, uh, was this um, rejection of the of the word sculptor in favour of making sculpture or other other ways about think, thinking about a, a, a kind of professional identity. Um, so really, I guess first for you, Natalie, is about about the status of that of that word or that term, and, and about forms of of uh, self identification as as a sculptor or not. Um, yeah, I think I um, I think I'm often quite struck by what Griselda Pollock says about putting women artists or women sculptors together, as if that that then becomes a separate category, or mm. perhaps even a category that can be judged less favourably with sculptors who happen to be men so I think we have throughout used the term sculpture by women wherever possible so I think that that has been very important to us from the beginning yeah, and yeah. I, was, I guess I've got a follow up with I might, I might just throw, throw out to the audience a bit, a bit later I was, I, was, I was thinking about is there maybe you've got some, some thoughts both of you something also about how um, uh, these, these artists are, are navigating a particular uh, world of avant-garde production. I just wonder if we went into the, the records of the Royal Society of British Sculptors, would we find different narratives of how women have you know, negotiated a kind of different sort of set of 
of um, professional expectations and, and, and practice? I don't, that's a question I don't know the answer to now, mm -hmm. but we're thinking about w working in a particular world of, 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 of being avant-garde or at the cutting edge or, 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 or making kind of challenging work. There's obviously yeah. another whole another kind of load of sculpture that's being made all the way through through this period by, by people who would be operating in a different kind of organisation. Yeah, I think certainly from the work that I've been looking at in the Arts Council collection, I think around the 1960s into the 1970s, women are at the vanguard of changing mm. the materials and the references in their work, which does ultimately influence men. And Joe referenced the quote about Reg Butler making derogatory remarks to Phila DiBarlo, and she actually talked about that with George Fullard, mm. and he said, well, he doesn't understand where this is going, and actually, uh, you know, women's practice will lead the way eventually, mm. and that really helped Phila to, to frame her confidence, really. Mm. Um, I think that confidence is something that comes out through the interviews that Hillary and um, Catherine have initiated, this idea of confidence, not just making headway at art school but in those critical early years when you've graduated and operating as a, a young artist in a very competitive world and it's something that Rana Begum picks up on quite a lot and Holly Hendry there's a critical moment where you need lots of support but also a lot of self-confidence and I think that many artists have found that to be quite challenging especially if there are opposing forces around them yeah, so yeah. to speak yeah, yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of Hepworth, and this is something that's drawn out in the interview with um, Joe and Sarah, um, uh, Hepworth sort of um, changes her approach um, sort of throughout her working life and starts off by sort of being an artist and, you know, um, not necessarily um, a woman sculptor, mm. but also later, you know, reconsiders, um, you know, her position in terms of maternity, um, her position in terms of mother nature, in term, you know, there's, there's a kind of um, changeable, um, um, it, it's, not, it's not a fixed status and, you know, she was exceptionally good at navigating um, a, a network that um, was, you know, obviously predominantly um, led by um, men mm -hmm. and um, had an ability to be a chameleon that could um, then um, both, um, yeah, navigate that world, but also um, provide nurture and um, contemplation in relation to her work as as time went on. Yeah, yeah. This is just uh, interesting in 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 how uh, you know, planning to uh, further kind of present. Uh, this kind of extraordinary operation that's uh, both both now in terms of thinking about um, you know what you keep, how you how you how you show it, and all of that. But just simply giving people sort of access to this world of Hepworth, which is an extraordinary, complex, large operation happening down in St Ives. Her her role, not just in terms of creating sculpture, but running a whole operation. Um, most of the images we have of her, obviously, with her her, 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 her artworks and and that that. The kind of the creative side of it, but just sort of running it, employing people, um, organizing the space, designing the space, the kind of the architectural and design aspects mm. of it. Um, really, just um, things I'd never you know, uh, had occasion to really think about. Um, and just you know, your thoughts about about presenting that view of of of, of Hepworth to to others now. Um, I mean, I think. Um, uh, I think we, you know, we've seen very, you know, very recently um, new research um, that uh, Helena Bonnet, for example, has um, undertaken um, in terms of thinking about patrimonial legacy and the way that knowledge transfer and the way that we present um, artists within national art museums and, you know, the confinement of that. Um, also thinking in relation um, and um, in terms of the language of um, period house museums mm. and um, studio museums. Um, what the confinement of that is in terms of understanding a particular view of an artist. Um, I see that the Palais is less fixed and has all sorts of different opportunities um, that, um, you know, complements and not necessarily undermines what you see um, in Trewin, which, you know, is a you know, very particular um, space curated and constructed with the artist and, you know, obviously the... Um, uh, set up as a museum um, just immediately after her death in, um, you know, and opened in 1976. Um, but it has a, you know, a pretty um, fixed curatorial status. Um, the opportunity at um, the Palais um, could, um, you know, allow for 
um, you know, the very, very um, particular local elements um, of um, that building and that history, that grassroots history, to meet um, with her um, expanding um, practice, um, you know, on a very international level. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's specifically local and um, you know expansively international dialogues going on in that building, um, and in between all of that, there there is all sorts of different opportunities to view the artist in a number of different ways, and how we operate that building um, through its its other histories um, in relation to Hepworth, because they can't be completely negated, but how we um, present that and what, you know, what, what lens comes to the fore with that, which obviously it's going to be Hepworth, but you know, um, without sort of negating all of those other things. I mean, it was everything from you know, the town dance hall to um, a cinema to a navigation school to you know, a store to, you know, it has a huge rich history that's you know, very much part of the fabric of the town. You know, those kind of um, relationships can, um, through programming and, you know, clever kind of um, alignments can, you know, bring all sorts of different um, views to the artist, but also how we articulate and understand arti artist practice um, in the location of its making. You know. Great. Well, I think um, I should throw it open now, and I'm sure people have got some, some questions. Very basic question coming from that. Is it going to be open to the public at That's some point and at what point and in what way? Definitely something that um, we're, we, you know, yes. <laughs> in what guise? I mean, you know, um, we are on the road um, in a climate of um, capital projects that's not favourable, um, but um, it's um, a building that will not wait. It needs um, attention now, and um, you know, otherwise we will lose vital elements of its history. And so, you know, I, you know, really want to start talking about it, um, and that you know, it's not going off the radar. So, you know, we have to keep um, thinking about what value this this. Um, this studio has and what we can learn from it and start you know researching and thinking about it and presenting it even before the visioning for how logistically we're going to manage that space because it will have to wash its face mm. you know it's going to have to um, be um, it's, it's it, it, it can't just open um, it's going to as you mentioned it's going to have to be resourced and um, run and staff and, like and you yeah. know and historic building developments are the most expensive and difficult and it's in the centre of town and you know all of the um, again logistical issues of its redevelopment it's going to take time to do that so we need to get on with it um, you know just even the conservation management of the floor mm. you know um, we the, the building surveys have you know given us categories of urgent essential and desirable mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know these are one to two and three to five and you know um, five to ten years you know um, building yeah. projects can take um, you know Stephen to gain funding five years um, to get off the ground so you know we, we need to really sort of start moving that I'm not here to sort of <laughs> you know sort of say we're going to lose this but it's just it has to be thought about now it can't be um, you know mothballed and I, I guess sort of following on from that, I know that Helena talked about um, the Truin Studio, um, has, has done work on the Truin Studio being sort of fixed in this particular mm. time. There's a number of different photos up here of this studio. Mm. Will there be sort of a, a choice of it being shown at a particular period or will it be much more flexible? I think that's, um, you know, I mean, I, it, uh, I, I think, as I say, there's an opportunity to think very differently about how that that operates, um, you know, um, when Truin was acquired, it came with, you know, a number of, um, you know, significant um, works as, as part and parcel of that, you know, and gradually, practically every work in that um, space, um, you know, studio space and garden and the greenhouse, etc., is now within the Tate collection. Um, you know, this is a, you know, slightly different bag, although, you know, obviously it has its very particular histories. Um, I think, um, you know, we don't, we need to um, tell the story um, of the relationship between the two studios and that's absolutely key but I think reconsider what curatorially what the opportunities are mm. um, and um, you know I think a lot of discussion and openness about the visioning of that you know um, you know needs to happen before anything's you know decided. It's very interesting.
My, my last question, and then I will hand over, sorry, is just the coloured screens up there that were designed by Hepworth, do we know what they were for? Um, I think um, possibly backdrops for the, Sophie, backdrops for work and, yeah. I'm guessing that the, oh, I'd like to find out more about the contrast between, and you've already touched on this, the, there's a time lag between the incorporation of Truin and now the incorporation of the Palais de Danse. Mm. And presumably the conservation standards are very, very different mm. over, it's kind of like 40 years later virtually. Um, and yet, in a way, perhaps one, one was incorporated in a rather loose way wouldn't match today's conservation standards. But in, in the other way, the, in, on the other hand, the conceptual content was more fixed. And now you seem to, it's almost kind of exactly opposite that you have a, a much more constrained conservational environment to work within, but you have a conceptual environment that is much more expanded, which, which seems very interesting, but also kind of complicated for mm. you to, um, to work through. And you've touched upon it, but could you just say a bit more about the, the difference between what happened in when the Barbara Hepworth Museum was created after her death and the situation that you have now in terms of the standards you have to meet, but also the kind of intellectual thinking. Um, I mean, I, I think um, uh, since, well, in the last um, 10 years, um, I would say um, conservation um, approaches to the Hepworth Museum um, are, you know, have, 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 have developed and, you know, the planning around the museum and um, the conservation planning, you know, is radically different to when the um, museum was taken on. It, there was a big project in um, 2013 um, that, um, you know, certainly reviewed how to care for uh, an environment that um, is not, um, you know, a muse uh, you know, an interior museum that, that has a building management system, etc. And so, you know, I would say that now um, the approach to um, both museums, you know, is is com is comparable. Um, uh, I think, you know, there was a Hepworth's voice very much determined what would happen with Trewin, whereas that, you know, is not um, something that you know is. Um, perhaps guiding how we think about um, the palais. That's that's key. Um, and as I say, it didn't come part and parcel um, as a already formed. It hasn't come part and parcel as a ready formed museum. So that's going. You know, that offers a certain sense of freedom. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion again around. You know, how the presentation and the um, elements of Hepworth's presence in that building, you know, um, completes the, um, the narrative um, of Hepworth's story in St. Ives, but as I, I sort of feel like I'm just kind of repeating myself, I just think that there's lots of opportunities to um, explore um, other um, aspects of her work, you know, again, um, from literal um, relationships to dance, um, uh, you know, and um, her whole... Um, history in relation to dance and music um, through, through programming um, and being informed by um, you know, other histories that um, can unlock um, new perspectives on her um, as an artist. Um, I don't know, whether, does that give you any more than, I'm not sure where I'm answering your question, but. Maybe it's not really a question for us. No, I, I just, um, I think, you know, that it, I think it's going to take some. It is a com it is a complex um, it is a complex um, situation, um, and um, it's these these studios are not um, they're outside the remit of a conventional art museum. They're also um, sort of trying to fit within you know the kind of um, uh, knowledge structures and. Um, uh, institutional structures in a way that they don't quite work. You know, it's it's an oddity for Tate to have such 
um, an organised, you know, such a such a um, such a um, object or um, such a building. And I think, you know, it uh, will take some, um, yeah, rigorous thinking to think about how that best plays out. If I could like, add to what you're saying, Sarah, but um, I think the fact that the, you know, the, what you said about the institution of a new collection with Tate, so the material and studio practice mm -hmm. collection, which actually means that, that there's going to be objects. So obviously you were saying about the Juno fancy dress, that that's yeah. been come to the yes. archive, and yeah. then there's the objects that will be left in situ. So the idea that you kind of, and that's the same with that true in studio, where there's, you know, the studio objects have now been acquired acquired by um by tate but they're going to stay in that less environmentally controlled environment so um so in other words like um that they yeah by making a new collection um that will that is not the same as the archive that is not the same as the main collection um you have this this idea that there are there, there's knowledge and there's different kind of mm. value in these items, but there's, but it's also about their situation in, in you know in these particular places. So mm. as you were saying about you know some of some of the items are still just staying there rather mm. than being mm. put in the archive. Mm. Um, thanks. So um, having been there for some of that process of the palette, mm. it's great to see these photographs. And just sort of following on from Helena's mm. point, there's a there's a kind of danger of not being able to see the wood for the trees, isn't mm. there, I think? Mm. that Oh, yeah. Seeing it stripped more in the photographs sort of brings out, you know, how that place could lead to kind of better understanding of Hepworth's working processes. Mm. Mm. And one of the things that strikes me that will come out of that, which Trewin maybe disguises, is that she's running a team of people yeah. who are making these works, mm. not a sort of single person yeah. heroically yeah. carving in the garden. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, having been through the process, there's a danger that you get lost in thinking about, you know, which of the biscuit tins are authentic Hepworth yes. biscuit tins, yeah. <laughs> and which are post-1975 yeah. biscuit yeah. tins. Yeah. Um, the family circle, I think, the, is it called family circle, the biscuit yeah. things? They look too recent to me. Yeah, um, yeah, I know. Well, and you, you could know, go down that route of, you know, how should we maintain, yeah. you know, these tins yeah. in a, you yeah. know, salty environment? Or do we focus on what we understand from yeah. this? And the other thing, actually, which I hadn't thought about much before, is that a really important part of Hepworth's life was her place in St. Ives, yeah, the community. Yeah, absolutely. Her yeah. engagement with the physical fabric yeah, of the community, town. community. And actually just turning the place into a public resource. Yeah. It doesn't need to be about her. Could, in a way, be continuing you know, something she did. This is, I mean, you know, I, I, I think... I don't think that we would negate her presence there. You know, there's too many important elements like the floor and, you know, her interventions into the building, et cetera, that, you know, need to be preserved. And, you know, and, and there's a certain continuity, as you say, in relation to um, this being a more sort of industrial space to the domestic space of Turin studio and, you know, and, and the fact that it was fundamental to the development of her practice and bronze and, you know, even though it was a very short period. Um, but absolutely, in terms of programming and how the space is used and how she was, you know, somebody that opened her studio to the community and, you know, certainly we would very much want it to be used by the community and needs to be used by the community. Um, and um, as soon as we start talking about this in St Ives, there will be a huge amount of interest in what happens to it and how we... So we've got to go... I'm, you know, um, I don't have any... I re you know, I, I mean, I have my ideas about what could happen in that space, but I'm um, open to a lot of discussion because we have to go through public consultation and various different things before we even, you know, st start to move forward how we how we approach that. Um, I, I think this, this, this could, could go, go on. on and on yeah. and on. I will go on and on, yeah. on but um, I think there's probably a moment to draw this, this session to, to a close. Can I, can I come to yeah. yeah, please yeah. do, please. <laughs> Joe, um, just even, you know, I have friends in the 80s who were at art school who were experiencing those same sorts of issues. And um, I just thought in, oh, is it Sunday? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I just thought, um, I was going to ask you one question as well, but I just thought in terms of Hepworth, I'm just thinking, it's so interesting because we have this, you know, going back, I, I'm sort of wondering, what, what, what really were the reasons why Hepworth managed to be so successful? 
at the time when she was. I mean, we, I think it affects the way we view her as a person because we, I mean, I think of her as just such a strong force and such an amazingly strong person. But it, I just think it might be quite interesting. I'm sure other people are, are looking into this. The other reasons around the, the, the period at the time and the artists and the milieu, which were actually different from the kind of macho time in the 70s. You know, there was a lot more intellectualism and she was able to participate in that. So that's just the way I was sort of thinking, and I don't know if anyone is looking into that at all. Um, and I just wanted to ask you one question just about that sort of hiatus in the 70s. Whether, does the Art Council have a policy of kind of redressing that retrospectively or not? Yeah, um, on the Hepworth front, I must confess I am not a Hepworth expert, so I would be very <laughs> interested to open that question to the, to the crowd. I think that in terms of the 70s, um, when artists are working in less sculptural forms, so in performance and film and video, we are collecting in that area. We've just recently restored a work by Mary Yates, which at the time was called Third Area because it was neither painting nor sculpture, but it responds to land art and has um, sound and um, photographic content. So I am looking specifically at sculpture when I reference that kind of dearth, but that also artists were working in other areas um, and that we, we do have stronger holdings in that area. But even, I think even in land art, we did a show called Uncommon Ground about five years ago. I think we had um, some work by Philippa Ekobishan in that show, but it, I know that um, um, Joyce Lehman at the Slade has contributed to our Breaking the Mall catalogue and her experience of curating uh, and ha ensuring representation in the 70s was really difficult. So although we do have pockets of areas, it's still a fairly weak area. And the Arts Council introduces a new policy in the 70s where it invites people to come and curate exhibitions. So you have Richard Cork curating a show called Beyond Painting and Sculpture. You have George Melly, but again, from a specific, I mean, quite a narrow demographic group and, and representation in those shows is, is really quite poor as well. So it's, it's across the board, it's acquisitions, it's who we're choosing to select and it, uh, yeah. it's, it's that kind of culture. I think the institutional culture seems to be quite strong throughout the 70s and it takes time for feminism and all those debates to filter into actual working practices. Yeah. I, that's how I see it and I think there's other research to be done. Yeah. Uh, I think it's in 1980. It, it happens almost overnight, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, there's a whole PhD to be written about the Arts Council collection and its history, but I, I think something happens in 1980, um, which I think would require some further conversations with those participants. And it does seem to have instant change, which is positive, you know, in terms of how we can move forward. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.